This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Today we're talking with Hayden Polseno Hensley, the co founder of Red Rooster Coffee Roasters in Floyd, Virginia. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Christy Furio. I'm your host for the show, and I'm happy to have you along today for this Founder Friday talking with the co founder of Red Rooster Coffee Roasters in Floyd, Virginia. I've been aware of this company since about 2015, and ever since then, the more I learn about them, just just the more I like them and their company and what they stand for. And I feel like you're going to have the same impression, too, after today's conversation with Hayden. So uh, really excited to share this with you. Now, Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is a leading specialty coffee equipment supplier. They curate the best equipment from around the world to fit perfectly with the needs of both their enthusiast and professional customers. So if it's a home bar that you desire or a commercial coffee bar and you need equipment to outfit that, then they can help you out. Prima-coffee.com. Helping you succeed in making great coffee at home or in the shop is what drives them. And so if you're looking for the best equipment and expert assistance to go along with it, look no further than Prima coffee.com. Can't recommend them enough. Check them out online. Reach out to them via phone or email and let them know that Keys to the Shop sent you. Thanks, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop. This show is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series, which is the fantastic line of plant-based performance beverages designed specifically for professional baristas and the standards for excellence that they demand. So whether you're using their almond, soy, coconut, rice, or oat milk, Its ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance of your coffee beverages focused on the coffee makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. This is a company that puts a lot into the barista community and the specialty coffee community. These products are just one of the evidences of that fact. They care greatly for our success in specialty coffee. I would encourage you to go to pacificfoods.com to learn more about the Barista Series line of plant-based performance beverages and find out how they can elevate the standards for your non-dairy offerings in your coffee shop. Thank you very much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. All right, so today we're talking with the co-founder of Red Rooster Coffee Roasting in Floyd, Virginia, Hayden Polseno Hensley. This is a company I feel has been a hallmark in my mind, uh, a standard bearer, of what it means to be excellent and humble at the same time. Um, They have grown their business in this small town in Virginia, and in that small town, of course, they have a great reputation, but also on the national stage, they have a great reputation as well. They are a good food award-winning company and winning awards in 2017 and 2019. They've placed first in America's Best Cold Brew Competition at Coffee Fest, as well as America's Best Espresso at Coffee Fest. They have over 40 coffees that have scored over 90 on Coffee Review. Just recently, had come in first place in Brewer's Cup over at um, Nashville Coffee Champs, Grace McCutcheon winning that. You can find their coffee all over the nation, and they are constantly striving to become more and more excellent at what they do in crafting amazing coffee, but also creating a culture and an environment in their business that cares for more than just the coffee. It cares for their community. It cares for their people in extremely substantial ways. And I think that is sort of the theme of this whole conversation with Hayden. And we get the inside information about the evolution of this coffee shop um, and how they decided to evolve the brand, what goes behind the decisions they make for what they focus on. We talk about their values and mission, the, the process of learning Uh, to roast coffee from scratch and how exactly they invest into their staff and their community. Um, This is the company that just recently launched a daycare in their retail space, Uh, this being born out of a desire to serve even more. A company like Red Rooster is the type of company that represents all that is good in small business retail in in this uh, focus on the humanity of the business, while at the same time focusing on delivering excellence in their product. And we cover both of those 
in detail in this conversation with Hayden. So I really hope that you enjoy this. Uh, There's a lot of great things to take away if you're a barista or if you're a coffee shop owner. So get ready to learn the story behind Red Rooster Coffee Roasters with the co-founder Hayden Pulseno Hensley. Hayden, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Glad to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's exciting to be here. Yeah. So, what, what's been going on with with Red Rooster? You all are you're you know out of competition season right now. How how did that all go for you? Uh, well, I, I think it went pretty well considering. Um, you know, we we did quite well in Nashville at the qualifiers. Mm-hmm. I was very pleased. Obviously, Grace took first place in the Brewers Cup in the qualifiers. Yeah. Congrats. Uh, thank you. And. Tony, I believe, placed seventh in the Roasters qualifiers. And, um, you know, we made a, a sort of a team trip to Nationals for the first time. And um, it was it was a very intense experience. Uh, we had been to Nationals one time before with uh, a, a brewer uh, in 2017. And I think because Expo was very was happening at the same time. Uh, the whole experience was intense, but I didn't have any expectations uh, about where we would place. Um, but this year, having Grace place first and, and having all the competitions all take place at one place without Expo being there, um, it, it was far more rigorous and far more intense for us. And, and I think we learned a tremendous amount. I mean, I can't. A uh, pretty rewarding experience. Certainly, uh, from the side of learning about what people are achieving in specialty coffee, what pe- what the expectations of judges at competitions are, and uh, meeting many wonderful, uh, enthusiastic coffee professionals, uh, mm-hmm. very rewarding across the across the board. Yeah. Well, I got to say, I was introduced to your company back when we were running America's Best Coffee House competition at Coffee Fest, and um, you were just talking about how you got to meet a lot of great professionals, and those relationships are really rewarding. I feel like getting to know you and your team was one of the highlights of that competition for me and the other judges, and anybody who interacts with your staff, I feel, are, are interacting with something really special because uh, you've created such a great culture there at your roastery and your shop, and and that's especially one, it's one of the reasons why I'm really excited to dive into uh, the story, your story, and the story of your company today. So, I mean, well done in creating something that I think really just uh, automatically gives back to people um, with just your presence. Uh, I, I want to kind of take a step back, and you're almost ten years old now, right? As a company. Yeah, we'll be nine in May. Nice, nice. Congrats. It's huge. Um, what is it that it prompted you through your career, your previous careers, um, to start a coffee shop? Because you weren't always um, in the coffee business. Um, that's correct. So uh, the impetus was squarely on my wife's shoulders um, in... in uh, Let's see, I believe it was 2005 now. It might have been 2004 um, because I wasn't in the picture at that time. Uh, (laughs) My wife and her sister and her mother started a little coffee shop above uh, her mother's bookstore, so above my mother-in-law's bookstore. Tiny little coffee shop with a um, two, uh, one Bricoletta single group home espresso machine and a um, a, then later on, a quick mill, a uh, Vetrano quick mill single uh, home espresso machine. Okay. Um, and they bought coffee from Cafe Ibis out in Utah. Right. In bulk. Uh, bought it. Her, her mother, uh, you know, was very strict with the books and, and would only buy it enough to get free shipping. Um, and then, um, you know, would go through that coffee until they needed more coffee. Um, and I think it was not uh, not something that they thought about in terms of a career. That's not something that they thought about in terms of specialty coffee. They thought about it um, in terms of uh, something quaint and cozy and something to do 
um, and something that fit well with the bookstore. And then um, my wife and I, we actually uh, dated in high school and then we were apart for about 12 years and then um, got back together. Yay. Luckily. <laughs> uh, That's quite a long time to be apart. It was, yeah. But we have mutual, uh, really close friends who actually were, um, w- they were actually our business partners when we first started the, the coffee roasting business. Um, and so they kind of like always brought us back together and kept us in touch because I was kind of best friends with the, the husband and she was best friends with the wife. So it just sort of happened like that. Um, in any case, um, she, one day in 2009, late 2009, uh, Rose, my wife just said, you know, I don't know that we're doing the best job that we could do with the coffee and I want to know more about it. And I think maybe we should even start thinking about roasting our own coffee because it would be fun and, and it might be, <laughs> she foolheartedly thought it might be cheaper. Um, and we, you know, maybe we could, you know, sell a little bit of coffee to our local grocery stores or, you know, our, some other customers and restaurants around the area, um, which is a, you know, a really small, uh, rural community. So it's not like we thought we were going to do like a lot of volume. Um, and I was working construction at the time. I had been working construction for about three years to, uh, maybe four years to put myself through graduate school and then to, you know, just have a job after I was done. I moved back to my hometown after finishing up graduate school in Anchorage, uh, Alaska and then, um, needed, needed some work and I was ready. I mean, when she said that, I was like, that sounds great. Whatever gets me out of building a deck in, uh, 10 degree weather in the ice and snow, I'm in. <laughs> So I knew nothing about coffee. I knew absolutely nothing about coffee. I, um, I, my, my like pivotal coffee experiences were like that I served coffee on a cart in, uh, the design and decorator building in Manhattan for a summer where I pushed a coffee cart around that building while like famous and rich people walked around and selected the chandeliers that they would put in their uh, okay. homes. <laughs> So I'm just going to say I, I did serve coffee to Harrison Ford. So, you know, wow. that, that goes on my like my sprudge celebrity uh, um, coffee service <laughs> story. Um, and then I think, you know, I ha- actually had a, a little bit of a formative experience where I was building a studio in an apartment for this friends of ours, actually, who every morning they brought us uh, Jittery Joe's. They, they love Jittery Joe's out of Athens, Georgia. And they would make that coffee for us every morning and bring it up. And I like, I was like, yeah, you know what? This is better than what I normally drink. <laughs> this is good coffee. And, uh, that, that helped sort of frame my, my approach when we started in, uh, thinking about roasting our own coffee. Did that sort of um, come to your mind as you so as you started to think, okay, I'm going to be in this professionally now. Let's think about all the experiences that I have in coffee and draw from those because, uh, you know, maybe previously you were just thinking, yeah, I've had good coffee in my past, but it's not something I think about. Yeah. Actually, I think I, I felt like I knew so little and I had so little experience with what was actually specialty. Um, that I just started completely from scratch. I threw everything into the fire. I didn't have any preconceived notions. I started reading Kenneth David's books. I started reading, you know, whatever book I could get my hands on, really. I um, went and took some roast, like a roasting training and coffee business class from a, a company called Jumpin' Goat down in Helen, Georgia, huh. which had re- had just been like on the news because the guy had gotten laid off from Hewlett Packard during the, you know, the recession and, um, started a coffee business. Oh, and nice he was pivot. On CNN. Yeah. So he was on CNN as having, as like a success story after the recession, you know, and, uh, it turned out he was teaching these classes. I mean, in the end, he was not really like roasting coffee the way that we roast coffee. 
Um, but he taught me a lot about the coffee business. Um, mm-hmm. He was a he was a very shrewd businessman, and um, I was very happy to have that experience. So uh, I am not a very shrewd businessman, I should say. <laughs> I mean, you know, you you become shrewd, I suppose, after you've had a business for a while. Right. You have to make all the mistakes yourself, I guess. Yeah. So this existing business, was it called Red Rooster at the time? Uh, No, the cafe was called uh, the Blackwater Loft. Mm. Uh, So for a long time, we we sort of like, um, you know, had a push and pull between the Blackwater Loft and Red Rooster because we had started we started roasting coffee under a different name and because my wife never really liked the name Blackwater Loft um, you know it was like right at the same time that like Blackwater Consulting was in Iraq and it was like all of oh, her God. customers were always like making jokes about no. black, black ops you know <laughs> you send them a cease and desist letter is that <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, so in any case, um, we had the, we, her and her mother continued and then her mother owned the cafe until I think 2014, uh, which is when Rose and I ended up buying the cafe from her mother and, and taking over the full spectrum of the business. Cause really she, she owned it, but Rose and I managed it. I mean, particularly Rose, you know, made all of the decisions and, really really ran it as the owner even though her mother was was the, on the title you know interesting so when it came time for you to dive into everything um it sounds like everything was on the table like we're going to change all this stuff about the cafe about the roasting and the business model is that the case or was it just roasting then we'll see i think it was just roasting then we'll see um and then You know, what that does, though, is it opens up the whole world of specialty. You start thinking about the service of the drinks. You start thinking about the how long has the coffee been in the AirPods. You start thinking about recipes. You start thinking about latte art. You start thinking about about all the things that go into uh, making your end product look good. And so you just can't help but think about cafe service and think about you know, all of the other elements that go into coffee. Um, you know, when I started, it was like, uh, I just thought a lot about Peter Giuliani and, and, uh, Jeff Watts and Dwayne Soros. And those, those were the guys who were like, you know, on the, on the cutting edge of coffee sourcing. And those companies were on the cutting edge of coffee roasting. They were like, held up intelligentsia stumptown counterculture all held up as this sort of like beacon of of uh what coffee should be like you know on in the literature that i was reading Mm -hmm. and i went to counterculture and took classes i i like walked 12 blocks in the snow from the train station to intelligentsia in chicago and like interrupted their vp of sales and he gave me a tour (laughs) and Gave me some coffee, you know. That's beautiful. And, uh, yeah, he was actually, it was incredibly generous of him. Like I, I, I had emailed him before and I got my dates wrong. I'm, I'm really good with time and dates. And, um, he, and then I emailed him from the train or I called him from the train, like, Hey, I got my date wrong. I'm here. And he was like, ah, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm just too busy. And then he hesitated for a second. It's like, you know what? Come on over. Oh, and, uh, very nice. We walked. Walked over in the snow and, and saw their incredible, like huge, you know, giant probats, uh, crushing out black cat espresso. And, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> That's one of the highlights of, you know, as, as I came through the industry and intelligentsia was just shooting up and they were the, they were the ones to look to. And, and, yeah. you know, many, many ways, of course, still are. Um, but that roastery, <laughs> Every time you see the multicolored roasters in that big warehouse, it's just overwhelming and inspiring, too. Yeah. Um, it, as you talk about this, I'm struck by the fact that there are so many people out there who might not have taken such a proactive approach to starting to roast coffee. Because maybe reading a book about it, you know, and then 
playing around on a roaster and you know coming up with something that you think is passably better uh whether out of ignorance of the greater world of coffee or out of pride like i'm gonna figure this out myself like wh- what about you made you want to go and get so deep with learning and exploring the possibility of specialty coffee uh, especially considering that you hadn't had a real deep background in coffee before that well, some of the other thing is just that I, um, I, I was never a great a- academic, but I tr- could have trained myself as an academic. You know, I, I went and got a master's degree in literature and, and I enjoyed, I just enjoyed the learning process. And so th- that was a big part of it. And, and I think also that I, you know, from a, a personal pride standpoint, I have trouble being wrong. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to be in a position of having to explain myself in a way that like didn't make any sense or that I couldn't justify. And so I just wanted to make sure that I knew everything about what I was getting myself into. Well, that's wise. Anything. I wonder if you might have uh, reached a point where you said, you know, if I learn any more, I'm not going to do it. I still feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what What was the trigger? What's the point at which you said, you know, I've learned enough to be able to now purchase this roaster or or launch this company with some degree of confidence? Well, I think it was a collection of people that we started the business with, um, you know, our, my childhood best friend, his wife, and um, my wife all decided, well, let's do this thing. I mean, uh, we asked them aboard because she was getting an MBA, and that just seemed like, well, we should have Becky help us out, you know? <laughs> and uh, he's an incredibly talented woodworker who actually made all of the tables and bars and all the furniture in our current cafe space. And um, it just seemed like a really good partnership you know um and it was and it worked out just fine except for that they moved to atlanta and um it just they weren't able to run the business um, with us so we ended up uh taking over the rest you know taking over their shares and and just running it ourselves we paid them a little bit of money for their shares but it wasn't worth anything at the time so it just felt like a nice like kind of friendly activity and we just thought well you know, to be to be perfectly honest, her dad put up a bond of twenty five thousand dollars at at a, a local bank, and the bank loaned us twenty five thousand dollars. Wow, that's great! And, and so, being able to have somebody who had a little bit of cash in the bank and was like, "Yeah, I'll take a risk on you, kids. Um, not too much of a risk. I'm not going to give you the money myself, but I'll put up a bond and get some interest on this money while the bank loans you the money." So we. Bought a U.S. Roaster Core three kilo roaster um, that was electric because the footprint of my mother-in-law's building didn't have enough space to actually have a propane tank on the outside of it. Like there wasn't enough real estate. <laughs> so we bought. Uh, I mean, in retrospect, we should have got a you know a couple of propane bottles from the grocery store. Um, realistically, for the way that I wanted to roast and I ended up trying to roast um, the electric roaster. It just has heat elements wrapped all the way around it. And um, it can roast the same profile every single time, every single time with hardly having to do a thing. So if that's your jam, then the electric roaster is where it's at. <laughs> but if okay. you're trying to, um, you know, create, interesting profiles based on uh, heat application and airflow, then maybe not so much. Yeah. So it was not, it wasn't really there uh, to give the coffees the nuances that they, they could give you, but it was consistent. Exactly. Exactly. And we were still roasting lighter than all of the people in our immediate area. Um, with the exception of Lexington Coffee um, in up in Lexington, Virginia. So, uh, you know, we we garnered a reputation for having 
uh, a lighter roasted coffee, even though a lot of those coffees were darker than we probably roast now in a lot of cases. Well, the town was used to a darker roast, it sounds like. So what was the reaction to your coffee? Uh, we're talking about um, how, how large is Floyd, Virginia? So the town of Floyd has 450 people in it. Okay. <laughs> and the county of Floyd um, has 15,000 people in it. It's, it's one of the biggest um, geographic footprints uh, county-wise in the state, though. So it's pretty rural. Um, you know, we, we, we live 13 miles from town. Oh, um, wow. My wife okay. And I, yeah. So, the, you know, <laughs> it's rural. It's, it's rural Southwest Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And, um, I don't really know how we thought that we would be able to make a living doing what we're doing. Uh, it, I think if we had thought a lot about it, we probably wouldn't be here today. Um, but the people, uh, responded slowly. You know, I worked really hard to try and talk to people about natural processes to, to you know, to talk to people about, you know, what, what kind of flavor profile they should be finding in these coffees, even though like I shudder to think what those coffees tasted like when I started and I was describing them, uh, to people, but, but, you know, people respond to education. I think every coffee professional will tell you that, that like customers want to know more about the product. And the part of the reason that they're going to pay more for your product is if you're able to tell them more about your product and why it's better mm -hmm. or why it's different, you know, and that was the, we, we, we would stay open late on Friday nights and there was a farmer's market, like an artisan market outside of our door. And then there was a farmer's market on Saturday morning. And I would spend Friday and Saturday just telling people about the coffee and why they should buy it and why it was different and why it was interesting. We wrote, we were roasting in 184 square feet with three kilo roaster and some carts that Benji, uh, my friend, the woodworker, who was our partner, uh, built that were rolling carts that looked like cabinets. And then you pulled them out and they had a bag of green coffee in them. Wow. And um, underneath the countertops where we bagged and sealed the coffee. That's killer. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. And, you know, it was an amazing space. And we had, I, I kept it about, I kept seven different origins in there at a time. And I mean, that was, that was what I could hold. <laughs> you're, it, so this, these humble beginnings are, are they, for a lot of people, they just are focused on becoming big or maybe not really satisfied with where they are right now. Not that ever, not that you necessarily were like, this is all I want to do, but <laughs> it, it sounds like these, these beginnings were just right for where you were and not only your location and what people expected, but what you could do yourself. Cause I was just thinking like you're learning about coffee just along with them and then you're turning around and teaching them. So it's like your palate and your perspective is developing right alongside your guests. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think I, I think that I drank cream in my coffee that I was roasting and not to say that you cupped I, it, you cupped it with cream. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I drank cream in my coffee for uh, like the first nine months that I was, uh, roasting all right you know so i i mean that's that's how far beyond the you know, kind of uh the curve i was i mean i was cu i was cupping coffee i was drinking it black to taste it and then when i would go upstairs to the cafe to get a cup of coffee for myself to drink i would put cream in it mm. well then, no hate you know this if, if you like coffee with cream in it but I, I get what you're saying like you have you have uh to know the truth of the coffee as the roaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you see, you you see how far we've come. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's, yes. that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> oh man! So you're as you kind of grind out this education for yourself and for your customers, and you you learn the roasting, and you develop the business a little bit more. At a certain point, I imagine you're you're thinking far into the future of what this could become like what were your goals 
as you were doing these events, as you're talking to people about coffee, were you thinking five, ten years down the line what you want this to become? Maybe in some way, because I actually just moved into a building. We just purchased a building that is on the outside of town, right, as you drive into town. And um, that building went up for sale the year that we started roasting coffee, and my wife and I kept on being like, wish we could move into that building. If we could ever move into that building, then I think we'd be where we want to be. Um, and now we moved into that building, but I wouldn't say we're where we want to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I, I think that I thought, um, I just want to know as much as possible. I want to, and I want to continue to grow and learn. And I, and I do have some personal like, pride wrapped up in in this so i want my greatest some of, some of my happiest moments are like my friends uh in other cities who are far away buy my coffee off of their grocery store shelves like sweet that 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 was the kind of thing that i was really looking for you know like i have a friend who lives in brooklyn new york and he buys our coffee off of his like neighborhood grocery store shelf neighborhood market you know yeah that that to me just like warms my heart to no end. And it is, it is as exciting as anything that we do to think like I, I've made enough of an impression on the like coffee community <laughs> that people who, you know, thought that I was out of my mind to start a coffee roastery, not knowing anything about coffee are now purchasing my coffee in, in far flung destinations. So. You would have to have gone out and gotten those accounts in grocery stores at far-flung destinations and pursued those wholesale uh, relationships. Um, uh, what diff- What is the focus in terms of um, cafe versus wholesale? Is it like 50-50 of the focus of the company to to grow as a cafe? Or is, or is it most, more so just to have a cafe presence where you roast the coffee and then grow the wholesale and grow the roasting? Yeah, definitely the latter. Um, because I think that there's a ceiling on what we can do here in Floyd. I mean, with, you know, 15,000 people in the county, we can certainly be more efficient in the cafe. We can always do better on quality. We can always have more, um, bag coffee sales and merchandise kind of sales, brewers and t-shirts and things like that. But, you know, at a certain point, um, we're going to have to start asking people to commute here from Roanoke or Blacksburg or Lynchburg or you know, far flung destinations to come down here and, and buy coffee. And that that's really much more of a weekend tourist activity. And so I think that we we see there's a limitation to what we can do out of the shop here. But um, the shop, the new shop that's in our new building is doing, I don't even really know the numbers, to be honest, but uh, it's doing much better. <laughs> it's far busier. Um, it's not on the se- it's better. not on the second floor anymore. It's not on the second floor. It's about three times as big and, um, we have a parking lot. So, so you can add all those factors in and you could imagine yourself, uh, how much better we're doing. Uh, yeah. Well, shoot. Our, yeah. That sounds environment. great. <laughs> but I don't really see a ceiling with the, the coffee roasting. One, I, I say all the time that the, the best business decision I ever did was to hire Tony Greater X as our head roaster. Um, he worked in a small, in our, probably our first specialty cafe customer. He worked as a barista there. Didn't really love the structure of the cafe and wanted to learn how to roast coffee, was, was passionate about coffee. He came, I taught him everything I knew about roasting and he surpassed me within about three weeks, um, in terms of experimentation in terms of his his palate and what he brought to the table in terms of you know coffee knowledge and and where he wanted to go with coffee and how he wanted the coffee to taste and um you know that that basically freed me up to to market and sell the product and 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 together i think we made a really good good team doing that he he likes to stay in the back and put his headphones on and crush out coffee and i'm more uh i'm more useful as somebody who can go out and talk to people about what we do and why we do it to answer your question the coffee roasting side 
right now, I, I think is the wholesale side of it is probably 65% of our business. Then we have another, you know, um, 20% that's our online sales and then 15% out of the cafe. Those numbers are, um, kind of pulled out, pulled out of a hat right now, but they're pretty close to what we're doing. Um, and, and I would like to see, um, the roasting and the online business grow, obviously. What is it that makes you keep the cafe around? And, and I mean that in the sense that where, you know, it's an expense, you've got to deal with hiring and management and all of that. And you've got so much, um, success with the wholesale side. Um, some folks might say, you know what, we're just gonna, it's better for us to just roast coffee and we'll, we'll just do that. What, what are the, what's the value of having something that you're actually pouring into you're expanding? Yeah. Well, I think that my wife would ask the same question sometimes, um, because she really is the lifeblood of the cafe. She manages the cafe and, and has hired almost all the baristas and she works in the kitchen two days a week. She's down there right now. And, um, it, it, it like you said, uh, it's very, it can be very, uh, logistically difficult to run a coffee shop. And we felt like we wanted to have an example for our wholesale customers of what we were striving to push them to do because we offer top to bottom training and consulting for all of our uh, wholesale customers. We sell the equipment, we install the equipment, we train the baristas and we come back for barista training and upkeep and preventative maintenance on the machines. We do just a top to bottom wholesale treatment for our cafe customers. And we're always pushing them to, uh, to push their own quality and to work hard to have quality because we believe that's the way you make money in specialty coffee is that you, you have to have the quality so that you can charge the prices that you need to charge in order to make the money. And we wanted to show them what that looks like in the cafe. Um, and also we sell a lot of whole bean bags of coffee out of our cafe and we wouldn't have an outlet to do that, nor would we have a way to show people the value of the bags of coffee. So they're expensive, you know, um, we sell them for a dollar cheaper in house here than we do on our website just to try and give a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a helpful nudge to our local customers to buy the coffee. Oh yeah. But it's nice for them to taste the coffee, talk about the coffee, learn about the coffee, have it as a pour over, have it as drip, have it as espresso, whatever, whatever it may be. And feel like, you know what, this is pretty good. I think I will drop this 17 bucks on this bag of coffee because I have had an experience that relates this bag of coffee to me in a way that I understand. That all makes perfect sense. Uh, and I'm with you on that. Like your cafe also probably teaches you a lot about um, just the business of the cafe as you expand it and learning how to help people more as you go. Just, just the yes. same as you were learning about roasting and tasting along with your customers. It's like you gain wholesale clients and you you learn as you teach them. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think that being able to answer the questions that your customers have on a very specific level, and being able to really answer those questions without guessing, which I mean, I think I probably was guessing for like the first four years. Uh, that we had wholesale customers, when, you know, especially the cafe is like, I'd be like, my best understanding of this is that it should be like this. Whereas today I really feel like I can say you should do it like this because it has been proven to be effective. <laughs> nice. Well, it's good that you just said it differently in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you, you buffered yourself there a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I give myself a little out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so now, I mean, you only had a few employees when you started this path to specialty coffee with this existing business. As you expanded now, you've got um, close to, if not exactly, 30 employees now? 
Yeah, well, we have uh, we have 27, and then we have four employees in our daycare. So uh, under under the whole roof, we have 31. Um, mm. Talk yeah. to me about that daycare. That's just recently come into the spotlight in specialty coffee. We just did an episode on kids in the coffee shop where you know we we had one uh, couple that has a shop in Indiana where they have a a fantastic playground area. Right. And you've seemed to take it a step further now with an actual daycare, which is a uh, huge, I don't know of many, if any coffee shops that do that. So what, what prompted that? What are the values that sort of led to that decision? Well, I think I would have to reach really far back to talk about the values. And, and, I, and I think that one of, one of the things that I would, you know, just, speak to is the fact that we're really a family business. And I think you'll find that with a lot of coffee companies. I mean, even at the, you know, peak level, there are, there are people who are hiring their family, uh, to come and help them because it's a low margin business. And a lot of times you can't pay people what you believe that they deserve or what they want to be paid right at the very beginning. You need them to sort of like earn that in for the first six months to a year. And, and, and that's, that's hard to like ask of somebody uh, who is not your family, <laughs> quite honestly. Yeah. And yeah. so um, it happens a lot, I think, in, in coffee businesses that like those first two or three years, you end up leaning heavily on your family. Um, and, and ours is no different. Um, you know, my wife has four sisters and they all work for us. And, um, you know, uh, her youngest sister is Grace, who just won the Brewers Cup in Nashville, and who is our our head trainer here at Red Rooster, and just mm. just finished her AST courses, so she's a certified uh, SEA trainer now. And um, you know, that goes that kind of goes uh, down the line. So. We have spouses, we have families who work for us who, uh, you know, two spouses and their child is in our daycare. We have multiple married couples, uh, multiple family members. And the way that we have always tried to think about our employees and think about the way that we grow is to treat them as family. And I, you know, I've, I've received a lot of advice to say, don't do that. Don't hire your friends. Don't hire your family. It's only going to be trouble, and and you know, in many ways that's true. But that's that's uh, that's the that's the path that we've chosen, and that and that we 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 didn't get into this business to be business people, um, and to be cutthroat, and to be uh, to only be concerned about the bottom line and the margins. We we started this business from the very beginning to say we're going to make every choice uh, within our own values. And that is the kind of, that's the reason that we're starting a business. It wasn't, you know, coffee happened to be the business at the time because my wife was in coffee already. But when we were starting the business, all we were really thinking about was like, how do we do it on a value based system? So as soon as we could switch to biodegradable coffee bags, we did, you know, that's just one example of how we tried to do that. And so, um, we have children of our own. We were paying, um, uh, one of my wife's sisters to watch our kid. Then we were paying her to watch another kid. Then we were paying her to watch another kid. Then there were too many kids in the house and the people who, you know, the single parents, the working parents who were bringing their kids to be babysat were really desperate for their jobs and they were desperate for child care. And we were looking around like, well, maybe we need to make less money than people who live in urban areas. We live in a small rural area with a low median income. And um, maybe we could invest that money in a way that would be a long-term benefit for our staff and, you know, quite honestly, a short term benefit for us <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to, to have a have our kid uh, be taken care of, but B have all of the scheduling and logistics conflicts that come into play when you when you have employees that have small children. And 
several employees that have small children, um, you know, you get to sort of let go of those. And what would that look like if you could drop off your kid and you could feel you could uh, alleviate some of the guilt that you have from dropping off your kids so that you can go to work. That's huge. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I like to say, you know, that um, as a parent, when you are taking your kid to daycare, you cannot wait to drop them off and get them away from you. And then the moment that you drop them off, you miss them immediately and you feel terribly guilty that you have just dropped them <laughs> off. And left. So there's this like, you know, intense conflict within the parent of being like, I need a break from this screaming three-year-old. I cannot take it anymore. Oh, I feel and you. then as soon, as soon as you drop them off, you're like, oh God, I miss them. And I feel so terrible that I just did that. <laughs> and we get to, we get to, if not uh, uh, entirely alleviate it, we get to take a big part of that away from our parents because, I mean, our production team, our production manager is down there. Her three year old is in daycare and she can literally listen to him like singing in the next wall over. And, um, oh. you know, I think it comforts her. I mean, she, she loves it. And, and she loves the fact that he's in there. And of course, uh, whenever I'm on a conference call that I don't need to be, uh, really quiet, like on a podcast or something, I, uh, <laughs> I go to the window downstairs and watch, watch the kids and, you know, so it, it was a big investment. I, I, I always, you know, I always do want to mention that like we, we made a choice that I don't think that, um, I would voiced upon other businesses. I don't judge other businesses for not making the choice that we made, you know, because it costs us a lot of money and it continues to cost us money. Uh, we subsidize 80% of the cost for our staff. And so right now I believe we have nine or 10 staff children and, and, um, four, uh, like public out, outside of Red Rooster staff children. And th those, those children pay a hundred percent of the setup costs and, and our, our staff pay 20% of it and Red Rooster funds the rest of it. We subsidize the rest of it. Wow. Which means, you know, that we don't, we don't make money. We lose money on it, on it. But I think that we, what, what we lose in money, we make back in, um, in a workplace that people love to be at. I mean, you know, with, with, with the exceptions of normal things that come with going to work and normal frustrations of work. But, um, that, that is just such a big relief for, um, single and working parents to have that opportunity, you know? Yeah. That's, you know, kudos to you for doing that and, you know, even taking the hit that is financially for a, a bigger reason and being consistent with your values too. Like, in, in a way, when we serve coffee and we have great hospitality, we're doing it to make somebody's day better and kind of pivoting from that to another area that's not necessarily coffee related, but can be fueled by the coffee business the way that this is alleviating that particular stress point for some people and, and your staff the same way that healthcare having healthcare would as well. Um, sure. It's sure. Huge. And, you know, we do. We do that as well. We, we, uh, we pay a hundred percent of premiums for our vested employees. And then we pay 50% of, uh, premiums for employees who are on their way to be, uh, vested with the company. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, I'd like to do more. We, you know, we have dental vision and, and, uh, regular healthcare covered for our employees. But I think that, you know, there's always more. And I think, that's probably the thing we, we, we talked about, like, where do you see yourself and where, what, what is pushing Red Rooster to grow a little bit earlier. And, and, and I think that's probably the thing as much as like pride and reputation, um, in, in like national specialty coffee. Uh, the, the other side of the coin is trying to figure out a way to, uh, pay my employees more and to set them up for a, a comfortable life in the future, you know, whether it's through retirement plans or what have you, whatever benefits that I can offer to them, uh, 
for their, you know, for their future growth, uh, is, is, is a real motivating factor to grow the business and try and figure out a way, um, you know, to take care of the people that have helped get us to the point where we are even today. Mm. Do you feel like part of the way that you have worked in the past where, you know, you were talking about pushing that cart around in New York, serving the, the rich people, and you've kind of been <laughs> in this position of humble beginnings. Uh, is that perspective something that fuels the way that you view people that work for you now, like you would have wanted to be taken care of that way and therefore you are going to facilitate that for others that's a good question um i would say it's more that um i never expected to be in the position that i am right now and that i my parents are both artists and they're uh, potters they're ceramicists and uh, so we grew up, um, you know, not in poverty, but with parents who work very, very hard um, in a creative field to provide for us. And um, I had planned to be a novelist or a journalist or a writer of some sort and expected to be in the same position of trying to like work really, really hard to just kind of make enough money to get by and be in a creative field. Um, and then it turns out that's exactly what I'm doing, <laughs> but it's as a business owner, as to work really, really hard to make just enough money to get by in a creative field. Um, <laughs> uh, but I happen, then, then I happen to have 31 people who work for me at the same time. Um, and so I feel the weight of them and wanting to take care of them, um, added on to that basically. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, um, I think, I, I think I also, I, I, I would also say that, um, you know, I had a, I had a jaded and skewed view of what a business owner or a businessman quote unquote was when I was a youth and even a youth up into, you know, approaching the age of 30 or or so you know and thinking that like the business owner is always going to make the decision that uh helps him or her and is always going to try and skim off the top of whatever they do for their employees so that the, the bottom line always looks better so that they can drive a bigger car so that their shareholders get more money etc cetera, etc cetera, right Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I still think that's true for a, a large part of the world, but I do think that coffee in general seems, uh, and certainly in small coffee companies, people try to buck that trend and take care of people. And I don't, you know, we're no exception. So, and that's definitely the perception of business in general, you know, even, um, you know, from when you're a barista and you, you view ownership as something I, I tell management classes all the time that people generally assume something negative about people in power and authority. And it's kind of up to you to prove them wrong in, in the way that you conduct yourself. And uh, for a lot of us in business uh, or own businesses of any kind, we look to examples of successes. And oftentimes there's something wrong with those examples. Like they are after the bottom line only and we just by osmosis sort of pick that up and it trickles into the way the culture of the community is so I'm, ex I'm especially happy to hear you talk about these things because you're providing your own example as something people can be inspired by um, to kind of counteract any negative examples that they've picked up along the way of trying to hack it in owning a business well i hope that's true I hope that's true. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, you know, we've been talking a bit about this, um, the business as it relates to your people and your community. Um, you know, I, I wonder now with the coffee and the way that you operate as a roaster in, in sourcing and things, what's your operating philosophy for your quality, you know, the things that you make decisions on in the in the roasted product now versus versus then like what what drives 
the decisions you make to feature certain coffees and um, what do you, yeah, what drives your decisions to feature certain coffees, roast them certain ways? Well, um, I think that's always kind of, it's sort of like a sine curve, you know, it's, it's going up and down. I, I, but, um, cause certainly when we, when I first hired Tony and when he started roasting and he was, he was thinking, you know, light all the way and, and really wanting to define Red Rooster as a third wave coffee company. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I think every coffee company probably has this kind of, uh, moment where you realize, well, uh, I do have to make money and in order to even be able to keep the lights on. And I also don't want to be um, pedantic. I don't want to be dogmatic in my approach to coffee. I don't want to tell my customers there's only one way for you to enjoy coffee, and that's the way that I enjoy it. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? And And I think that's like the... The complaint amongst the general public about specialty coffee is that they feel intimidated and they feel like, <coughs> pardon me, that they feel intimidated and they feel like their barista or whomever it may be has a, a, an air of judgment about them and the way that they're going to enjoy their coffee. So we have strived really hard over the past, I would say, two to three years to say, we are going to roast coffee of the utmost quality. We are going to purchase green coffee of the highest quality. We're going to involve ourselves in competitions um, like the Good Food Awards, which we were lucky enough to win in 2017 and 2019. Yeah. And things like the U.S. Coffee Champs and roast coffee on the upper echelon of specialty coffee quality while also maintaining a line of coffees that are approachable that grocery store customers and people who are new to specialty can come to and see have quality taste the quality difference between the conventional um, you know sort of blended varieties that that they might drink off the grocery store shelves and and drink our coffee which you know i'm not down on blends i, sh I shouldn't have said it like that uh -huh. we, we blend coffee too and yep. and um you know it's an art and um i think that trying to balance that uh basically has helped shaped our philosophy which is that our philosophy is that we're not dogmatic is that we want you to enjoy great coffee, um, no matter how you enjoy it, and that we're going to keep on pushing the envelope in in what we do on on the top five percent of what we do in order to push ourselves to be better because we can always be better. Everything we learn at the top five is sort of like it's sort of like Expo or sort of like coffee champs where like everything that you learn at that moment which is this, this like highly intensified crystallized part of the industry that is so small a percentage of of you know the rest of the coffee industry it still trickles down you learn about what people are doing in terms of quality how they're thinking about coffee how they're talking about coffee and then that trickles down to the rest of the industry ever so slowly through osmosis almost, you know? And mm -hmm. that's how we feel about the way that we're roasting when we're roasting, you know, single origin, natural Ethiopian, you know, that if we learn how to roast this coffee perfectly, then that will inform all of the coffee that we roast. And that maybe, maybe those blends that we have that have a little bit of dark, darker roasted Nicaragua blended into them. Well, maybe we can actually make them sweeter, make them more approachable, make them more balanced, whatever it is that we need to do to improve the coffees that are on the spectrum of coffee that maybe we don't drink, but that the vast majority of our customers drink, you know, can only help the company. The, the, our approach to quality is to not be dogmatic. It, it leaves a lot of room for 
tailoring what you do to the audience that continually is, you know, you're getting new customers and even your existing customers, their tastes change and you've got feedback given to you about your coffee. So if you're in, not in that dogmatic place, you can pivot pretty easily and not have to worry about overcoming this huge mountain of pride <laughs> in the process. Right. And, 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 and maybe not even pivot, but just learn from, you know, what our cust- what kind of feedback we're getting from our customers or what kind of feedback we're getting from, you know, industry people and, and how they feel about, you know, some of our coffees. I, I think that, um, we possibly have even sort of suffered from not being like focused and, 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 um, dogmatic enough in some cases, <laughs> you know, to say like, that, that there is something that people are, are, are sometimes looking for someone to just say, this is how it is and this is how it should be. And, um, since I don't know that answer and since I came to coffee late, you know, in the game and actually started a coffee business before I knew anything about coffee, like I've just never been that person. I just never had the confidence to say like, this is how it is. I've always just been a more of a searcher to say, I wonder what other people are doing. I wonder if I can improve my palate. I wonder if we can improve our coffee. I wonder, you know, what, what else there is to know or learn, basically. Wow. It, to me, it sounds like you are doing the same thing uh, with your coffee as you are with staff in your community, caring for the coffee, meaning uh, meaning that you're learning as much as you can doing the best that you can growing with it and uh, investing like how can it be better it seems similar to how you're making decisions to maybe take a, a financial hit to better the lives of your staff and better serve your community um, seems rem- remarkably consistent well i mean I, maybe it's just a personality thing between you know me and my wife and just the way that we approach things. Sure. And it's not purpose done purposefully to be consistent. You know, it's just that, um, I mean, another example of that is that, you know, we started out buying a hundred percent fair trade and organic coffee, um, before we knew the nuances of green coffee trading. And we still buy and sell a lot of fair trade and organic coffee. And I've watched the industry, um, you know, look down on, you know, the, the higher end of the industry, look down on organics and look down on fair trade and, and claim, you know, uh, that they don't really help producers the way that they should or, you know, that the, the certifications are too expensive, um, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, watch it, also watch the market vacillate wildly. I mean, the, the market almost over doubled within the first five months that we opened our business. And that wow. was in 2000, 2010. You probably remember when, you know, green coffee prices just went absolutely through the roof. Yes. Um, and then they said, you know, they came back down and, and then they settled for a while and now they've gone way down, <laughs> you know, below a dollar a pound for the sea market right now. And, and, and we're all just holding our breath for the next, for that next, time that the pendulum swings all the way back in the other direction and, and, um, you know, the coffee prices go through the roof and, and, um, uh, it goes back to not wanting to be dogmatic. I think that you can sit, you can poke holes in all methods of purchasing coffee and all methods of certifications and all, all the decisions that people make about what kind of coffee that they buy. You could find, you could find flaws with it, but if people are, genuinely just trying to do the right thing and like pay producers more and get great coffee and try and put those two things together honestly then um you know then that business is probably doing a great job and and um we just strive to we just tried to be a little bit like that to to buy great coffee and make sure that the producers are being taken care of whether it's through premiums from organics and fair trade or whether it's paying them directly ourselves uh, for great coffee, you know. What advice do you have for owners, operators of uh, specifically like roaster retailer models from your experience over uh, almost nine years now doing this? 
you've learned a lot, come through a lot. What would you advise somebody if you only had like a few minutes with them on the trade show floor <laughs> You're right? to impart some wisdom? What would that be? The thing I see in the industry right now is that everybody's a roaster. Everybody's starting, everybody's buying a little one kilo uh, sample roaster or a three kilo shop roaster, you know, and, and roasting coffee for their cafe and spending a lot of time and, and probably, you know, good time good investment in time taking fancy photographs of their operation and posting it on Instagram and making themselves look like they're a um, legitimate coffee roasting operation. Um, and that's fine. I mean, everybody has to start somewhere, but that uh, I see less attention paid to the roast and more attention paid to the latte art. Uh, right now and that that i think that pushing your craft in on the roaster uh, will lead to ultimate success and that the photographs and the latte art are kind of like a little bit short-lived but and then when you start drinking coffee and really thinking about what's in the cup thinking about what's in the cup when you pull a shot of espresso and what's what's really there um you know, you, you have to dig, you have to dig a little bit deeper. Think a little bit more about what your approach is and what are you really trying to achieve? Um, besides just sort of like a third wave light roast agtron color, you know? Yeah. Um, you can probably get a long way on Instagram, you know, I don't know. Um, but I think that's probably true. And, and, and that's fine. But at a certain point, you will reach a ceiling of being like, you know, is my coffee quality where it needs to be to satisfy the customers that I've garnered through social media or through great marketing? You know, mm-hmm. and great marketing will get you a lot of places. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, those companies that we talked about earlier, like Stumptown, Intelligentsia, Counterculture, you know, they, they had great marketing, but they had exquisite coffee um, and still do. And that's how they got where they are. Nice. Um, great customer service and exquisite coffee. And the marketing is sort of even secondary now, you know. So obviously we, we you know, we're not big. Don't I don't I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know uh, how big, you know, people might think that that we are, but we're not big. Um but we're 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 small to medium size, and we did get a lot of where we are um, through marketing and through just brand appeal, and uh, and and but also most of it, I would say, came through quality and customer service and and appealing to the customer as an individual, both on the roasting side and the wholesale side, and and on the retail side, that just quality and customer service really wins the day. Well said. Yeah. Um, Hayden, I, I really appreciate you taking all this time to, you know, go through your story. And I, I truly mean it. I think that this is uh, so instructive and inspiring and kind of a, a moment in an interview where I feel like it helps us root down into something that's more long lasting than we're just talking about Instagram posts and, You've definitely walked the walk in your business. How can we find out more about your business and find you online? Well, um, of course, we have a website, redroostercoffee.com, and poke around on there and learn about our people and learn about our wholesale program. And um, follow us on Instagram, obviously, Red Rooster Coffee Roaster. And uh, we have a Facebook page, which is... I think these days is mainly just reposts of our Instagram, but uh, that's kind of <laughs> the, the way of Facebook these days. Um, and if any, you know, of course, if anybody ever just like wants to talk, um, send an email to info at redroostercoffeeroaster.com. Um, myself or Tony or Grace would be happy to answer any questions that anybody has about the coffee or about our wholesale structure or just how we do what we do. Um, 
if anybody has any questions about the daycare, feel feel free to email as well. I'm I'm going to be on a panel for the um, Santa Ana Town Council uh, in in um, California about how to get more get more businesses to do what we're doing. So, um, oh, nice. you know, I, oh. I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. I don't have all the answers. Um, and it's only about five months old. The daycare is. Yeah. And so I'm still, I'm still learning there too, obviously. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I want to say, Chris, that, you know, it's, it's a great honor to sit down here and, and chat with you too, because, you know, I, uh, I remember, looking up to you and and watching your your career um you know and watching and oh, watching geez. you as a a mover and a <laughs> sort of like someone who was pushing specialty coffee forward you know five six even ten years ago just like working working in the industry being passionate about the industry and um you know reaching out to people being being a presence in specialty coffee and and i appreciate the opportunity to sit down with you. It's great. That's very kind of you. Thanks for that. Very encouraging. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the feelings, of course, mutual. And, you know, uh, again, this has been great. And, uh, you know, I think life-giving to a lot of people. So uh, we appreciate what you're doing and who you are in the midst of what you're doing, especially. So uh, thanks again. Well, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it a lot. Well, I think it's really amazing to see a consistent thread of integrity in the development of the business. Throughout this conversation, even something I mentioned to Hayden while we were talking, that there seems to be a consistency in simply being a people of integrity with everything that they do. And I, I feel like that is a great example to take away from a now almost 10-year-old business that makes decisions still on the mission and values that were around at the founding of the business and at the point of of turning in the business where they uh, went from Blackwater Loft to Red Rooster Coffee Roasters. They're not driven by the bottom line. They're driven by the kind of good they can do for the people that they are impacting and driven by the idea of doing good for more people. And so I feel like that's something we need more of. And whatever that looks like for you, if you have a larger business and you want to grow to many many locations of retail, you can still employ the same kind of mission and values in your company um, for your context. It applies the same way. It's just a matter of being consistent and making the choices to live up to what your mission and values actually say. And um, I, I love that even when it meant not necessarily making as much money as they could with something like the daycare. They just felt like it was the right thing to do. And it's refreshing to be able to see that in practice. It's certainly an inspiration. And thank you so much, Hayden, for taking time to talk with us on Keys to the Shop. You and your wife's crew and your business, they just really enrich the specialty coffee landscape. We're really thankful for you. And again, thank you for joining us on the show today. Now, if you want to reach out to me, you have questions or comments, feedback about the show, you can do so by emailing chris at keystotheshop.com. I also, through Keys to the Shop, offer consulting and training for you and your staff. My focus is to be able to help you elevate the standards of your operations and systems, your managing of people, and the quality of your product in your shop. If you have issues or problems that you're dealing with that you need diagnosed in your store, this is where Keys to the Shop can also help you. I would encourage you to reach out chris at keystotheshop.com. You can also go to keystotheshop.com on the consulting page and learn more about what specifically uh, I can do to help you in your business. So I look forward to hearing from you. And thank you, all of you, for joining me on the show today. It was such an honor to have Hayden on. And it's always an honor to have you along for our journey of learning through these interviews with great coffee professionals. So have an amazing weekend. And I hope that today's Founder Friday episode has truly given you keys to the shop.